Uh, but, but just a bit of context before we hear from our panellists. Uh, this, this panel arises from the um, defence and security theme in the 21st century um, project. Um, we undertook um, research, um, we, under we participated in workshops um, with both Australian and American colleagues uh, on both sides of the Pacific um, over a, a period of uh, two and a half years or so. The, the charter essentially was to explore the, the challenges and the opportunities which were facing the Alliance um, as we move into the 21st century um, in what is obviously a, a rapidly changing region. And, and, of course, we've heard a great deal about the, the rapidly changing nature of that region um, today. But there have been some very significant changes even since this project um, got underway. And I, I'm, I'm thinking, of course, of the fact that the, the, the balance had barely begun when we began the research um, for this enterprise. Um, we've seen in that period of time, of course, rising tension in East China and South China seas. Um, we've had a democratic setback more recently in, in Thailand, but on the other hand, um, some, some movement forward in, in Burma. Um, we've had a, a comprehensive renovation, I think it's fair to say, of, of Japanese security policy over this period of time, and, and of course a, a great deal more has, has taken place. So it was against this background that the Defence and Security Group um, looked at the, at the alliance, and we looked at various themes. We, we spent some time looking at burden sharing and interoperability. Um, we looked at defence uh, defense acquisition programs. Um, the geostrategic landscape in which the alliance would have to operate over the next, um, as we move into the century, extended deterrence, um, and we looked at some areas of cooperation in relation to non traditional security, and particularly in relation to humanitarian and disaster relief. So um, there was a great deal on our agenda, as you could well imagine, um, and there will be a report in due course about the work we've, we've done, and it'll be published. Um, but for the moment, um, I think uh, the important thing is, is to get underway. And, of course, we now have a very distinguished panel of discussants um, to, to take up this theme. Um, whatever you think about the asymmetries in the alliance, um, it's not on this panel, because, of course, we have two Americans and two Australians um, to participate. Um, Ambassador Carl Eikenbury um, from Stanford, and as you will also know, he was US Ambassador to Afghanistan. Doug Pahl from the Kanayi Institute for International Peace. Alan Gingell, um, latterly of the, the Director General of the Office of National Assessments. And Peter Lay, uh, now of the National Security Institute, but of course also a former Chief of the Australian Army. A very distinguished group of people indeed. They have also given me leave not to say anything further about their CVs. They're all in the program and I would encourage you to, uh, to look at that if you need to know more. Um, but I think we'll start and Carl is going to begin, I think. Well, if this were a golf, we got uh, the worst tee-off time handed to us, but we will make up for this with some exciting talk about hard power here. I, uh, I, the shadow minister actually has set my uh, brief uh, remarks up very well because uh, given the great attention that's being given right now uh, regionally and increasingly globally to U.S.-China relations, I thought it would be useful just to say a few words about the so-called uh, paradigm of the uh, rising power versus the uh, status quo power. It's a hot topic politically, militarily, in academic circles. In fact, in uh, China, uh, several years ago, there was a really brilliant 12-part uh, series just called the, uh, the Rising Powers or the Rise of uh, Great Powers that uh, really sees Chinese audiences. So believe me, in Beijing, this is also a hot topic. The contest of the rising power versus the uh, status quo power is usually cast in the following way. Disaffected, increasingly frustrated, ambitious rising power, and uh, they'll then try to change the status quo by seizing territory, expanding their uh, zones of influence or their spheres of influence, trying to revise the regimes and norms that were established by the status quo power. So they improve their positions that way. And then the status quo power, confronted with this, they have three choices themselves. They have the choice of reducing their commitments or accommodation, as the shadow minister talked about. They can transfer obligations to allies and partners. We see some of that in the Asia-Pacific region today. 
And then they can also look to increase their own means. In other words, to focus on their domestic foundations of power. So this much is very straightforward. But when you examine the details then of the various cases, the instances of the rise of great powers and the potential conflict then with the hegemonic power, you find that there's more differences than there are similarities when you take these cases and apply them against each other, and certainly when you apply them to the case of U.S.-China relations today. So let's take the most commonly used example, and that's the one of a rising Athens, China, versus a status quo Sparta, the United States. Uh, Thucydides, the famous uh, Greek historian, wrote uh, well about this. Uh, he had the famous quote, it was the rise of Athens and the fear that this inspired in Sparta that made war inevitable. So now political scientists, strategists, they have the expression, the so-called Thucydides trap, and that is that then war becomes inevitable. It's not about personal diplomacy. It is all about the structure of international relations. So let's then look at the example of Sparta and Athens. Uh, the Athenians led the Delian Trading League, and the Spartans led the Peloponnesian Trading League. They were not integrated, they were segregated. Not at all, as the shadow minister had said, like today's world. Uh, nor did the Athenians hold $1 trillion of Spartan debt notes at the uh, time of the conflict, nor were there 250,000 Athenian students studying in Sparta at this time. So, again, it's true that in the rise of great powers uh, and their challenging of a status quo power, truly, if we look at history, there are more cases in history of conflict arising than not. But as we look into various examples, the kind of paradigm that we see throughout history simply, in my mind, does not apply to China and the United States in the forms of competition that we have. Let me make six points very quickly, then, about how I think there are differences, and there are some similarities, and through these we see risk and uh, opportunities. One, on the payoff from conventional conflict. The shadow minister, she, uh, she covered that well. There's less value today from land acquisition generally. Uh, land in the past meant population. It was a form of power. It meant agricultural uh, production. Uh, today, it does not quite obtain. I think that Russia's restraint in eastern Ukraine is probably an example of this, although you have to counter that the Crimea. There's also nuclear deterrence. So the value of conventional conflict has decreased. Against this, though, we have to look at the maritime domain fairly. And in the maritime domain, one, in the South China Sea and the East China Sea, we do have the potential for a miscalculation tactically leading to a strategic consequence. But beyond that, more strategically, frankly, it isn't clear that the lower value of land in the 21st century can be applied to the maritime domain. There's no disaffected populations and coral atolls to uh, have to uh, worry about. Economic gains can be considerable if you can exert control, and certainly if you can establish dominance over the sea lanes, and critical sea lanes like exist in the South China Sea, that can be decisive. Second point, external versus internal orientation. Thucydides talks about how Sparta and Athens are singularly focused on each other, but if we take the case of the United States and China today, it's stunning how much of an inward perspective they have. You have a domestic focus with both countries looking at economic restructuring. They have aging populations, more so in China than in the United States. Social welfare spending. China having to start up programs, the United States trying to figure out how to limit programs, huge problems with income inequality, access to education, educational reform, environmental protection, and homeland security. So I'd argue that both sides, strategically, but very much for their domestic reasons, do want an extended era of stability, and they want to try to manage their differences peacefully. 
Third, on defining a status quo in a rising power, is the United States a declining power, or is it in a power right now that's in retrenchment? I would argue the United States is in retrenchment. It is not in decline. We've had periods of retrenchment in the United States in the 1950s under President Eisenhower. We had a period of retrenchment under President Nixon. They made a strategic choice to, in, during this period of time, reduce obligations, transfer commitments to allies and partners, and to focus on the domestic base. That's what I think that President Obama is trying to do right now. Having said that, if we don't get our economic and political house in order, it will be decline and not retrenchment. Against this, the Chinese, how do you define China in 2014? We define China in 2014, the status quo that China faces in 2014. I think that we define that as 2014. An oil rig uh, is going out into the Paracel Islands, breaks that status quo. You can make an argument that the Chinese look at a historical status quo in which the last 100 years has been an anomaly and the historical status quo for this region is a very dominant China. Third point, or fourth point, on challenging uh, the challenges of formulating strategy. We live in a world which may become, is maybe becoming more multipolar. We live in a world in which there's an array of transnational issues which cut across state-to-state -state relationships. This then makes Strategy making from Beijing for the, against the United States and Washington against China, extraordinarily difficult. Back to the Peloponnesian War, a laser focus of Athens and Sparta against each other. But in this world, it's a complex world. It's a much more complex world. So to give an example, the United States, we have forces on the ground in Korea. We have a strong alliance with the Republic. We worry about North Korean missile capabilities. We worry about Iranian missile capabilities. Hence, the United States, and with collaboration with Australia increasingly, we try to field a good ballistic missile defense system. The Chinese look at that ballistic missile defense capability. They don't think about Korea. They don't think about Iran. They think about ballistic missile defense capability, the United States and alliances against China degrading their deterrent capability. The same challenge applies for the United States as we work with allies and partners. We think about allies bilaterally, we think about networks, but China, as they look at the United States, as we work with our allies and partners, they look at this as a zero-sum game. More ads for the United States as they count with the United States all the powers of allies. And if you look globally right now, the United States, of course, is in a vastly stronger position in this count. The Chinese can count one ally, North Korea, and the relations with them aren't too good. Fifth point, ideology and values. The United States, uh, Australia, have an extraordinary emphasis on democracy, freedom, and human rights. Uh, the Chinese will say, set aside values. You can have your values, we will have our values. This is about interstate relations. President Xi Jinping, in early 2013, issued to his party cadre the following instructions. We will not talk about constitutional democracy, universal values, civil society, neoliberalism, media freedom, historical nihilism, that's excessive criticism of the CCP's past, or we won't question reform. That sounds a lot like us. So I would argue that we have to be frank about this. Democracy is subversive to the Communist Party of China. It's a fact. And so to say that we can take values and put these on the shelf, I think, is folly in terms of our foreign policy. You don't lead with this necessarily, but to say that we can put them on the shelf, I don't think is possible. Sixth and final point, and I'll stop here. Charles Tilley was a famous uh, American political scientist, and he wrote the famous line, states make war and wars make the state. In other words, your historical narratives are very important for the United States, tied in with values. We describe ourselves too much, too often, as an exceptional nation, championing democracy and freedom, and we're on the winning side of mankind. China, it has a historical narrative also made in war, has an aggrieved and humiliated uh, 
needing to restore, as mentioned before, its rightful place in the world. It has a motto now, rich and strong nation. And history does matter because it influences how nations interpret their contemporary environment and how they define their strategic goals. So in this regard, the absence of historical reconciliation, so to speak, in the Asia region, I think, still causes a great amount of tension. I'll stop here. The point is not to say that U.S.-China future relations are problematic, or they're not problematic. But indiscriminately, though, casting China and the United States as actors in the Peloponnesian War, I think, is very bad history. It's very poor political science and it's a very flimsy basis for statecraft. Thanks. History does indeed matter, and thank you, Carl, for reminding us of it. Uh, Doug. Well, I want to thank the, the Alliance 21 men, uh, organizers to invite me all this way and to give a chance to see so many old friends and and uh, make a few new, new ones today. Uh, I'm really glad Carl Eikenberry just spent some time talking about the big picture in this rising power, resident power conflict scheme. As I, I'm a nuts and bolts person. I don't want to get into these high theories. I like to get down to what do we have to do with respect to some real big challenges. In, the, in, the recent, in this last week, the, the, uh, the, the issue that's driving the conversations everywhere is what's happening in Iraq and Syria. <clears throat> with the rise of ISIS, excuse me, and, um, and a few weeks ago it was Ukraine and and uh, Crimea, and one thing after another, go back to Libya, uh, Egypt. These things will be with us for a long time. But if we get China wrong, you know, we can, we can live with some damage to our reputation, damage to our interests in these other places. If we get China wrong, we're going to destroy the 21st century. So, I, from my point of view, I say let's. Let's, uh, let's get at the practical things we need to do with, with China to keep this from becoming a, a ruined 21st century. Now, my personal experience has been trying and working with China to take all the lemons in the relationship and turn them into lemonade. And uh, it's not an easy process. A couple of things I've learned over the years are that um, you need at least two narratives. One narrative you can't get away from. That's the problems. And as our relationship Yours with China grows bigger and bigger. We're over $500 billion in trade now. So, of course, we have trade problems. And we've got all kinds of uh, agendas in China that are playing out, and all sorts of agendas in our own society. They often conflict. We've got increasing numbers of places where China is reaching out and becoming active where they were previously quiescent. So China now has strong views about how to handle the Syrian civil war or how to handle... Libya in a crisis, and we are running into frictions in those areas. And of course, we have a, a calendar every year, and every year we have the springtime frictions over the memories of Tiananmen, and every editorialist and columnist in America and elsewhere has to unload himself yet again of our feelings about what happened 25, year, 25 years ago. And uh, the United States uh, also has the uh, annual uh, Shangri-La dialogue that we participate in Singapore with a lot of your folks as well, and we rehearse the many military difficulties we're facing with each other. And so as, by the time June plays out, everybody gets depressed and thinks there's nowhere to go. Now, a year ago this week, President Obama did something I thought was very wise. The other side of the narrative in U.S.-China relations, and I think for most of us in dealing with China around the world, is we have the problem narrative, but we also have the positive narrative, the constructive narrative, the, what uh, the uh, shadow spokesperson said a moment ago about the 300 million people rising out of poverty, China accepting more rules in the world, taking part in more international organizations, beginning in a small way to provide some public goods, such as in the Gulf of Aden patrols against uh, Somali pirates. And we've we got to be able to balance off these very difficult issues that come at us one after another and will never stop coming at us in the relationship with a positive narrative of where we can take this. Now, a year ago this week, President Obama did something very wise. He invited uh, Xi Jinping to come to a special summit at Sunnylands in Palm Springs, California. 
And it was, you know, I'm sure you all know the narrative, nine hours of shirt sleeves talk, supposed to be un, unrehearsed, really get to the core of things. The goal on the American side was to get Xi Jinping early in his likely 10-year tenure and take advantage of Obama being at the beginning of his second and certainly last term in office and see if the two cannot find some concord on the big issues that will provide that positive narrative going forward. Uh, it, it was really a pretty hopeful session. There were not many concrete results from it. There's some common language uh, from different perspectives on this business of a new kind of great power relationship between the U.S. and China, and both sides came to a kind of negative def definition of what that would mean, which was we want to avoid exactly what Carl was just talking about, the kind of uh, rising power, resident power conflict that has afflicted history. That was the good news. Unfortunately, for the last nine months, we've heard only the narrative of the problems, whether it's China's uh, pressure on Japan, the air defense identification zone that was a launched in November, uh, the um, tensions between China and the Philippines and China and Vietnam over these minuscule uh, disputed territories, not even territories, sometimes just submerged features under the South China Sea. Uh, and these have been dominating the narrative. And of course, within our society, we have a large number of interests that want to develop fleets and air wings and take care of our uh, military budget who speak up very forcefully that China is the coming threat and we need to uh, prepare ourselves appropriately for the th sort of threat that China is coming to represent. Um, my concern is that after nine months of this, we've most recently had this episode of the Attorney General of the United States indicting Chinese five relatively minor PLA officers for the offense of cyber theft of intellectual property. Um, this is an entirely uh, symbolic gesture. These people will never come into American courts or be tried. Um, it has the effect, however, as does our very public diplomacy about territorial disputes in the South China Sea or Chinese activities in the air defense identification zone, of creating a feeling in China that China is under pressure from the West, from the U.S. and its allies, and that the Chinese leadership must stiffen its spine and not show compromise to the outside world. Uh, that, in some ways, we're going to get that inevitably. But it needs to be balanced out with another narrative, which is that we, there are ways we can work together. The Obama needs, for example, to accept the return invitation for, for a similar shirt sleeve summit. That invitation, I understand, has been offered, but they're still going back and forth about whether it's a good idea and, whether, and when the timing is right for such a, a gathering. I think the timing is now, but I'm sure people will be preoccupied with other things for a little while in Iraq. The, um, th and this comes to the theme of the Alliance 21 discussion. You know, the, there are two uh, cliches about Australia that I've heard for as long as I've been dealing with Australia. One is Australia is the anchor of stability in the, in the Asia Pacific region. I remember 25 years ago, then Ambassador Michael Cook came to call at me at the NSC he had heard we were writing our national security report. And he wanted to get in early and say, would you please not repeat that cliche of Australia as the anchor of stability in the, South, in the, in the Pacific? Well, if you, had to, if you happened to read the documents coming out of last week's uh, meeting in Washington between the Prime Minister and the President, the White House led off with, Australia is the anchor. <laughs> so cliches persist. Another cliche is Australia punches above its weight. And Michael Fullylove did a wonderful piece a few months ago saying, come on, Australia, fight above your weight. You're not punching hard enough. And I kind of like that article. But my message today is to Australia, we could use your good counsel right now to lower the decibel level of American public diplomacy vis-a-vis -vis China and to try to describe that positive narrative. And I heard that from the foreign minister in her remarks this morning. She, was, she, uh, she talked about the re... Um, application of diplomacy. Don't shout all your problems. Set out agendas to work on them. And I think Australia has particularly strong points to bring. For example, in the South China Sea, if we keep fighting over territories, we'll never get to a solution. We've got to find things that we can pursue in common. There's energy under the surface. Common development makes sense. It's not going to be easy. There are fish. Australia has rich experience with Pacific migratory species, providing observation and things. 
I think this is where Australia can come in and give your American friends a little nudge and say, let's us and some other people who've got some experience in this area put some things on the table for China that will allow all of the disputants to back off on these resource claims and to begin to work on more positive agendas of cooperation. It won't solve all the problems, but it will help divert us from the path on which we're headed toward increased, intensified rhetoric toward conflict, and conflict which will destroy the 21st century. Thank you. Interesting, Doug, um, that alliances, of course, have multiple dimensions, and thank you for reminding us of that. Um, Alan, I think. Um, thanks, Russell. I, I want to uh, talk more specifically about uh, this alliance. I've just spent the last uh, few weeks reading, for quite other reasons, um, the speeches and memoirs of Australian uh, policymakers of the 1940s and early 50s. And if you ever need a reminder of continu uh, continuity in Australian security policy, that provides it. Uh, you could very easily cut and paste whole paragraphs from memoranda from um, Labor Foreign Minister Evatt's attempts to secure a post-war US naval presence at Manus Island uh, through uh, uh, Liberal Foreign Minister Spender's efforts to negotiate the ANZUS Treaty and simply insert them into the briefing that Tony Abbott took with him to uh, uh, Washington last week. Uh, it reflects the fact that since the end of the Second World War, generations of Australian uh, policymakers and diplomats have committed themselves to a consistent uh, national effort to keep Washington engaged in this part of the world in face of all the competing global demands on a superpower. And that's been true even when uh, relations were most strained under the Whitlam government with the Vietnam War at its most controversial. But thanks to the rise of China and the impact that's having on the international order, it seems um, highly unlikely that uh, that's going to be a problem for Australia in, in uh, future. We heard that very clearly from uh, Danny Russell uh, earlier. Yet success, uh, from the Australian perspective, after all these years, is going to bring its own set of problems. For most of the history of the Australia-US alliance, it's been easy enough for Australia to sign on to support the main elements of US security policy. The outcome of the Cold War was vital to Australia, but we had few distinct national interests involved in the regions where that competition played itself out, um, in Europe especially. We could willingly and sincerely sign up to US positions and policy approaches, extended deterrence, for example, with none of the nagging complications that sometimes faced NATO allies. Then more recently, as the focus of US attention switched to the Middle East and the war on terrorism, it was again not hard for Australia to align itself with US policy because independent Australian interests in the Middle East were limited uh, in both uh, Ira um, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, a principal reason for Australia's military engagement, was quite openly acknowledged uh, to be support of the alliance. But as uh, US attention pivots to Asia, Australia will find it has very particular national interests involved, and however much may, we may wish it were otherwise, these won't always align perfectly with those of the United States. I want to make it quite clear that I don't think we're heading into a new Cold War situation in the region for both China and the United States. The calculus of competition and cooperation is fundamentally different. Uh, from that between Washington and Beijing, uh, sorry, Washington and uh, Moscow, let alone, as Carl reminded us, between uh, Athens and, uh, and Sparta. A degree of ideological competition certainly exists, and we've heard sort of strains of that um, today, but it's much more muted than during the Cold War. And while China's international interests are growing quickly, it's unlikely ever to frame its competition with the US as a global struggle. So as the elements of Sino-American competitiveness grow, and they will, uh, they won't take the form of the sort of proxy contests on the periphery that marked Cold War competition in the early 1980s in places like uh, Mozambique or El Salvador or Afghanistan. 
Mind you, that's not entirely good news because the whole point of proxy competition is that it's easier to manage because it's conducted away from the centre. Competition between China and the US, on the other hand, whether it's uh, strategic, political or, economically, or economic, will come much more specifically at the geographical points of contact in this region, and that's going to matter to Australia. In addition to China's importance as our main trading partner, Australia has a range of other uh, interests with, with Beijing that go well beyond the commercial and the economic. After all, we've, um, we've ourselves defined the US-China relationship as a strategic partnership. It's not just uh, China where our interests may not always align completely. Uh, Southeast Asia is emerging as the arena in which a good deal of the competition between the US and China will play itself out. And in that part of the world, Australia will always have a very specific uh, set of national interests. There's quite a lot of historical um, precedents here. Take uh, Indonesia, for example. Uh, I can't think of a single part of the world where differences between Australia and the United States have emerged more clearly uh, in the past. Um, I, I simply can't think of another uh, uh, area. You think back to uh, Prime Minister Menzies and President Kennedy over Dutch New Guinea, over the demands for IMF conditionality uh, during the Asian financial crisis, and over differences of emphasis during the um, East Timor in intervention. Now, none of these disagreements threaten the alliance, and I don't see such circumstances arising in future. Uh, for Australia, the alliance between us and the wider US alliance system in East Asia remains as important uh, as ever to the stability and future prosperity of this part of the world. But as Australian and US policy interests rub up against each other more often, we're going to have to get better at understanding and sharing uh, not just our assessments of the region, but the particular policy interests each of us have in play on any given issue. The management of the relationship is going to require our full attention. There's another reason why this is important. Um, since the end of the Cold War, we've been through a 20-year-long period in which ideas about alliances have been tested. Uh, once the Soviet Union disappeared, what was NATO's uh, purpose, for example? NATO flailed around uh, for a while trying to find new tasks, but with only mixed success. And as US security attention refocused on non-state actors like al-Qaeda and global terrorism, friends, allies, partners all became much more interchangeable as part of coalitions of the willing. The US itself uh, embraced in the Bush Doctrine, a form of unilateralism that had less place in it for allies. Uh, finer distinctions were drawn between allies, between old and new Europe, for example. But thanks to a number of uh, global developments, especially China's rise and the regional maritime disputes that have accompanied it and Russian actions in Ukraine, we find ourselves back in a world in which power politics of an old-fashioned sort are again making themselves felt. This is a world in which alliances have again become more salient. The United States, the hub of the global alliance structure, is going through a period of introspection about international interventions. Uh, as a result, precise obligations, uh, who have them, what they mean, what reciprocal obligations they entail, will matter greatly. Uh, we've already seen evidence of that in the detailed attention the US and everyone else has given to its obligations uh, in the Senkakus under the uh, US-Japan security treatment. Uh, we've seen, uh, even today, uh, efforts by Australian analysts to get Australian uh, politicians uh, to pronounce on the implications for um, uh, ANZUS of... Uh, of uh, um, uh, problems in the South China Sea. And one lesson from Russia's seizure of Crimea was surely that a fundamental divide exists between obligations to allies and good wishes for friends. Um, you sometimes hear the line, we, we uh, heard it again uh, today, that one difference between the US and China is that Washington has allies and Beijing, North Korea apart, does not. Uh, that's true, but I wonder whether it's as significant as it might appear. 
Uh, in certain circumstances, um, allies are a strategic asset for a great power, but they can also be a strategic encumbrance. They require, as Washington is finding now, uh, careful management to prevent the major ally being drawn into unnecessary or unwanted conflicts. The absence of allies, on the other hand, can confer greater freedom, and perhaps that's one lesson Pyongyang has taught Beijing. For all the continuity I spoke of at the beginning uh, in Australia's objective of keeping the US involved in this region, the circumstances of that involvement and the aims we, we both have for it could hardly be more different than they were 70 years ago. And that's why the Alliance 21 project is so important in helping our two governments ensure that the alliance, this alliance, remains an asset uh, not an encumbrance for both of us. Thanks. Um, Alan, you'll be reassured, I hope, that um, we were very comprehensively aware of this challenge when we were looking at the project. And we, we of course, recognise the strength and the enduring nature of the, of the alliance, but we also recognise that the, the interests, were in, particularly in the emerging Asia, were, were could on occasions be quite different from one another. So a timely reminder, thank you. Peter. With 37 years in the Army, I think I learned a couple of things. Uh, first is satisfy the crowd. Uh, we'll try and get you to a point where there'll be time for questions, but perhaps the, the best lesson I ever learned was don't stand between diggers and morning tea. I think there's a civil application to that, and that's don't stand between diplomats, politicians, academics and journalists and a cocktail party. <laughs> and many of us will be going on to that a bit later. But I would like to pick up on uh, what Doug had to say and in particular talk about ways we can work together. And uh, it was certainly a privilege to work on the alliance, to work on the themes of budgets, strategic context, burden sharing and interoperability, basing in the Asia-Pacific, which has really taken some relevance more recently, Islamic extremism and non-traditional security challenges. So to give you something of a flavour of what we talked about, I do want to talk about how we can work together and perhaps both sides of that. So I'm going to talk about um, US and Australian cooperation in humanitarian and disaster relief operations. And I'll just make some points made by Admiral Gary Ruffhead who talked about burden sharing and interoperability. When the first 200 Hawaii-based United States Marines stepped onto the tarmac in Darwin in early April 2012, they were met by the Australian Minister for Defence. I'm not sure if they fully understand what was happening there, but he was there to greet them. But they were also met by a howl of protests from China and official concern from Indonesia. The Indonesian Foreign Minister, after a shaky start, eventually recognised that deployment as a valuable opportunity to boost humanitarian and disaster responses in the region. And I think he was being polite. The increasing acceptance, though, of HADR, and as an ex-military guy, the other thing I learnt was you've got to use acronyms, as a legitimate defence mission, has the potential to partially balance Chinese concerns about the arrival of US forces in Australia and perhaps in the region. And as other speakers have noted, uh, events have moved on since then, but there are, and I know General Simcox spoke about this this morning, there are established joint humanitarian exercises to be conducted between the US, China and Australia, and I think New Zealand is also involved. They are called Phoenix Spirit, but there's also Chinese participating in RIMPAC exercise this year. And I think it's really important that we keep those sorts of exercises running. But there are, of course, limits to the reassurance that HADR can provide. But let's recognise them as good neighbour missions and a step towards binding the nations of the region closer together so that we can meet the growing threat of disasters, respond to adverse humanitarian events and, if used appropriately, prevent the further decline of at-risk states into failed state status. Now, I'd stress that 
These sorts of missions are the lowest common denominator of military cooperation. But they do have benefits on the upside. And they include closer patterns of cooperation, opening lines of communications between countries in the region and professional dialogue between military forces. As we know too well, and uh, I've been privileged and saddened to go to places like Banda Aceh after the tsunami and to Pakistan after the earthquake, Asia is particularly prone to disasters and by some statistics accounts for more than 50% of global fatalities and economic loss due to disasters. With what seems to be the increasing frequency and impact of HADR, HADR events, many countries are seeking to develop new response capabilities and those developments have actually aided the relationships in the region and I'll stress both Japan and their relationship with Australia and Indonesia with their relationship with Australia. So recent disaster events have clearly demonstrated the enhanced capabilities and considerable generosity of many countries, including quite distant ones, to respond to emergency situations. This has enhanced regional geopolitical relationships as HADR capabilities are seen as non-threatening and an area ripe for early state dialogue between countries. I think they're a positive force for building trust and confidence between nations as they open up direct contact between individuals and organisations from participating nations in a professional, non-combat and well-defined environment. So these sorts of missions are a useful precursor to more substantial military-to-military -military engagement. Efforts to enhance interoperability should quickly expand as a means of building regional HADR capability, but also as a means of developing trust and confidence between countries where military cooperation is limited or where tensions are rising. Uh, we can hope but I fear that we shouldn't get too excited. So let me now turn to Gary Ruffhead's paper. And Gary spoke of expanding US-Australia defence interoperability. And I think this is appropriate, particularly because of the meetings between the President and our Prime Minister last week. Gary warned first that interoperability would be challenging given that we don't even spell defence in the same way. <laughs> but our alliance and the relationship and the common national characteristics provide a unique and solid foundation to expand US-Australia defence interoperability. His view was that interoperability binds and, if done effectively, can enhance greatly operations and save money. He stressed the importance of coupling personnel, logistics and operational planning at the very inception of an acquisition project to ensure the best outcome in later years. And he correctly observed, and I think we've all been beneficiaries of this, that with the US and Australia, interoperability comes easy. He explained that beyond the close valued alliance, there is at first extraordinarily compatible national attitudes that bind us as people and militaries. Confidence, ingenuity, optimism and initiative are unique common national traits and are the greatest catalysts for expanded interoperability. And the recent US strategy that rebalances the US to the Asia-Pacific region provides assurance of a continuing diplomatic, economic and military focus on the region and affords for both of us a more predictable planning foundation. Uh, he stated that even as the US grapples with its fiscal future and the US Department of Defence, spelt with an S, adjusts to a period of austerity, the priority will remain the Asia-Pacific. And although sharing a common regional emphasis, emphasis, the United States and Australia's respective global interests, responsibilities and expectations will call for increased levels of interoperability, not just on a bilateral basis, but for more complex and broader coalition operations. And today we've seen that many other speakers have commented on the regional and global security environment, uh, 
But let me say that Gary stressed that the maritime disputes in the South China Sea and East China Sea will not be resolved soon. And well, he got that bit right. But overall, the unique US-Australia relationship can be enhanced, combat effectiveness improved, greater operational effective efficiencies achieved and savings realised. I think we all in the theme agreed that we possess the culture, the means and the motivation to look at the totality of the activity and not become focused on individual <coughs> initiatives. And we certainly agree we must take the long view and rise to the occasion. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Peter. When, um, when we were establishing the research panel for the, uh, the project, and uh, I, I asked Peter whether or not he'd been would be prepared to participate, and I was conscious, of course, that he's one of Australia's great warriors, and that, that I wanted him to to speak on humanitarian and disaster relief, and he, and he took to it with great enthusiasm, and, and the results of that are, were in part of that paper he gave this afternoon. Um, and they're, in fact, online as well if you want to see more of what you've read. So thank you for that contribution, Peter. Um, we'll go to questions in a moment, but I thought I might just start off. And, and I thought I might begin by taking up a theme that um, the Foreign Minister raised um, in her remarks um, this morning, um, which, which, were, which was that she said um, one of the challenges for the Alliance is to build a relationship with the region. And in many ways, that seems to me to be the, the, a core challenge for the relationship. And, it, of course, there's been a lot of discussion about how the alliances may need to adapt. They might need to change in some way, um, whether or not the, the San Francisco system, the hubs and spokes arrangements that have been in place for, for decades um, can continue to be the structure of the alliance architecture in, into the, the 21st century um, do we need to bring more light? Is it, is it desirable to bring more allies into the relationship? Um, should we be thinking about the alliance becoming a much more multilaterally engaged uh, organisation? Um, should we be uh, expanding cooperation amongst the various spokes of the, of the alliance as, as occurred between Australia and, and of course, Japan? So I, perhaps we could begin, gentlemen, by, by just um, quickly looking at the question... Um, might the alliance? What, what, what might the alliance architecture look like? Do you think, as we move into the, the 21st century more fully? Um, anybody like to take that, or will I nominate somebody? Carl, you are a big picture person. <laughs> well, just just a few words. I think this is the uh, this is the uh, really the core challenge that we have in the uh, in the Asia Pacific region. We have a economic. Hierarchy. Some say that China is increasingly dominating that uh, economic hierarchy, but we have, we seem to have a clear way uh, forward politically that there's a consensus about how the uh, region can be further integrated economically. With the Chinese over the past year now turning around on TP, TTP as an example, but the uh, but the hard problem is how to bring this together in uh, in and create an integrated security hierarchy or, or mechanism. Uh, you have problems of uh, history. Uh, you do have the challenges that we face where you have the strong alliance structure of the United States, and we don't want to let go of that alliance structure. Uh, you know, you want to make sure that if you're uh, doing rock climbing, make sure you've got uh, uh, one hand uh, very firm before you uh, let mm -hmm. go. And so how do we take this forward? And uh, I don't think that we've got uh, any uh, great uh, ideas right now. Alan, you were thinking of this theme in, in your remarks. And, uh, yeah, uh, well, I mean, I, I, uh, I don't think I see the alliance itself as providing a security structure uh, for the region. I think the alliance, the alliance relationships underpin uh, security in, in, the, uh, uh, in the region. I, said, as I, I think, as I said before, that uh, you know, for Australia, not only our own uh, alliance with uh, the US, but the US relationships with, uh, with, its, other, with its other allies are, are absolutely critical. But I, and and I, secondly, I think that's also important uh, that Australia develop its own uh, distinct and independent 
uh, security relationships with the countries that mattered to us uh, in the region. But I would have thought myself that the complications of trying to use the alliance uh, system as the base for a broader uh, uh, regional security structure which would sort of ultimately engage uh, um, uh, China and others who are on the periphery um, is not the way to go. Mm. Doug, how does it play into relationship with China? Well, the, 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 the alliances need to be the bedrock. You can't, uh, you can't tinker with them in an environment with so much fluidity and so much risk. Um, we've had placed a lot of bets on ASEAN, but the ability for ASEAN to speak as one has been diminished by the two-tier character of ASEAN and the different uh, efforts to influence different members of ASEAN and uh, issues. Hope for the six-party talks to turn into some kind of Northeast Asian security mechanism have now evaporated. And so we're, we're in a very delicate period of hunting for mechanisms to solve problems one by one and hope that around that we will grow some new ideas. Uh, most recently, the Chinese have been trying to walk away from the Shangri-La Dialogue as the incipient security forum a la the Munich conferences in, in Europe. Uh, and they've been focusing on the ADMM Plus as a, a preferred venue. Uh, it's, it's really in a very fluid period. I think one role of the alliances will be to try to find opportunities to coalesce mini lateral or you know, small groups of, of countries that are willing to get involved in trying to res resolve some specific problems. But we should keep our ambitions in check, but our eagerness to keep working on these problems uh, well stoked. Mm. Peter, perhaps you've already shown us the way forward with this, with, the, <laughs> with your remarks, but uh, any further mm. thoughts? I, I think I'd make three points. Um, first one is I think that Australia probably wouldn't enjoy any dilution of the alliance that we had with the US. I think it's, it's so valuable to us, and I, and I just think of some of the exercises that we've been engaged in, um, the big tandem thrust series. We, we've been very keen to, to keep that at that level between the Australia and the United States. Nor do I sense any real appetite in the region for some form of NATO-style alliance where there would be formal agreements, and, and we had the question about uh, answers and the answer, I think, brought into that sort of nature that NATO is actually about commitments. Uh, so I, I don't see that. But I'd make the third point, which is that um, the militaries in the region and with General Simcock there, we spend a lot of time doing what we call military diplomacy. And I think that's very important, uh, establishing those relationships. And one of my concerns over the last 10 years, I guess, is that most of the time I spent travelling overseas was flying over Asia to somewhere else. And I think we have to re-establish those relationships, those natural and personal relationships into the region by spending more time in the Asia-Pacific region. Yeah, thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, questions? Um, Gareth. <laughs> I'll give you the first opportunity if you are brief. <laughs> I'd like to... Um Congratulate Doug Paul on, I think, the most mellow speech I've ever heard him make. <laughs> in, that, in, in particular, for your rather intriguing suggestion uh, at the end that Australia might have a useful role to play in encouraging US leaders to moderate some of the more strident articulations of their anxiety about uh, Chinese policy. In that context, I've had a long concern, and maybe this is exaggerated. If you think so, tell me. I've had a long concern about what I think has been the overuse by American leaders talking about US role in Asia, of what I call the DLP words, dominance, leadership, preeminence. The L word in particular, leadership, is absolutely routinely used, as it was last week or so by President Obama. In your experience, Doug, do Chinese interlocutors find that constant use of those words, leadership word in particular, neuralgic? Uh, and if so, does it really have a negative resonance or am I exaggerating that? And if so, to what extent is it possible to think of US leaders moderating, with or without Australian support, the use, regular routine use of that kind of, I think, negatively self-reinforcing rhetoric? Well, I can have I, it. <laughs> it's great to see you again. As you're one of the old friends we haven't seen in a long time. The, um, the, the, the last... Uh, meeting I had before I got on a plane to come here uh, 
last Wednesday was with a Chinese journalist who was doing a long history of my life, but who couldn't leave without venting on the question of American constant harping on the question of leadership. And of course in Chinese it's ling dao zhi xia. It's under somebody else. And, and so if the Americans are leading, then everybody else is subordinate. And that gets to them philologically, emotionally. But we also just throw it around too much. We've just been too rhetorical and too little uh, into substance on policy in the last year or so. You could make a case for you know, 50 years if you want. But on the ba great balance of things recently, we've become uh, a shouting nation, which has not been attuned to how we're being perceived by those being shouted at. And we're actually ha we're, we're creating negative feedback in the Chinese populace at a time when the leadership in China is trying to show that it's tough and they're being encouraged to be tougher by having to respond to the various things we've done. I mentioned in my remarks the cyber case. There are lots of ways of going after cyber. Uh, we, a couple of us tried to get the dialogue on cyber started back when Obama first came in and they started the strategic and economic dialogue. But our recommendations were rejected in favor of treating cyber as a liberation technology based on the Iranian street revolution of 2009. And that got us nowhere with China. Then we discovered so much was being stolen, we had to fight, get traction, and we can't find traction with the Chinese. So they came up with a strategy and started to deploy it in early 2013, only to discover that Snowden had undermined the strategy mortally, and it was not gonna, we we're not going to get anywhere. There are ways you can deal with the Chinese uh, threat, and we, a lot of them is by doing counteractions, taking action against a company that's stolen intellectual property and leaving a, a, a digital calling card that we were here and will come back if you keep doing it. Um, that's the, where we need to go, and we don't need to involve the public in China in this. This could be done without having headlines and, and, uh, and notices of, of uh, indictments of Chinese officers that only anneal the population against us. Carl, yeah, I, I would agree with your point about uh, perhaps a degree of hubris here on the part of the United States with, you know, the continual talk about uh, leadership. Having said that, I mean, we can change it to coordinator, uh, you know, a cheerleader. Uh, that, that's, that's not going to change the fundamental dynamics in this region. And uh, China is looking at the Western Pacific right now, probably like the United States looked at the Western Hemisphere in the 1820s and in the 1820s and 1823, we had a President Monroe who declared a Monroe Doctrine, and that doctrine was one which said Europeans not invited for colonies and interventions. That's a vital interest of the United States. That's been a doctrine that uh, we've maintained since. I think that uh, we had extraordinary situation in the Asia-Pacific region after the Second World War. From 1945 until today, the Western Pacific has been, for American security purposes, an American lake. And I think the Chinese are taking issue with that. They're not trying to get the Americans to evacuate the Western Pacific tomorrow, but as they look at alliances, they look at our relationship with Taiwan, they look at American sensitive reconnaissance operations off their coast, they don't like the status quo. And so they're increasingly, I think, going to take measures to try to get new rules of the uh, road. And that's a challenge then for all of us. Back to, you know, what do you do in that case? Do, can you make accommodations? I think in the interest of the, uh, in the case of the United States, we do have to think hard about uh, some reasonable accommodations to growing Chinese interest and uh, influence in the Western Pacific and their aspirations. <coughs> I mean, the, the rhetoric question is an important one, but it's not just in relation to China, is it? It's in relation to the, the messages we send around the region, um, Doug, that the way America speaks to the region has an impact on its friends and its allies and, and understanding its intentions. Well, the rebalance is an example of that, or the pivot. Um, when, the, when the rebalance was first formulated, a few of us were invited in to get massaged about it, and we were really very enthusiastic. And in my mind, it was... The, after losing our way post 9-11 and post the 97 financial crisis, we were getting back to 1989 when the East Asian Strategy Initiative was inaugurated to try to protect our investments in the Asia Pacific where it was growing while we were building down all the post-Soviet structures in the rest of the world. 
And, and so there's been a lot of continuity, which we kind of lost for a while, but we're back to continuity. But unfortunately, when you push the button in Washington, DOD just goes out there and talks. You know, Leon Panetta gave a speech in Shangri-La. I later spoke to him about this, and I said, you know, you sounded like Leonid Brezhnev. An hour-long thing about building up the military. And, and he took it to heart. Frankly, he was very good about it, because he subsequently went to Beijing the following August and spoke to the Defense Academy in much more muted terms. But you turn the button on in, in the DOD, everybody out there is out rebalancing, rebalancing. But you don't have the counterpart discussion from the diplomats and the economic side, the trade people, because those three are the integral parts of the rebalance. It's not just a security question. So you're right about that uh, perception. Um, yep. Up. Thank you. Uh, uh, John Murray, lecturer in uh, South Pacific Island Affairs. 42 countries share their borders with the Pacific Ocean, <coughs> the largest of these being the United States, China, and Russia. 38% of the world's economic exclusion zones are located in the Southwest Pacific. This morning, General Simcock gave us an outline of what the United States is doing to further America's uh, role in the Pacific region. My question to the panel is, is there any evidence to suggest that either of the other two major powers are doing anything to derail the American goals or whether they are running parallel programs themselves to garner support for their own discrete geopolitical aims in the Asia-Pacific region? Who wants to come at that? Um, I don't want to talk all the time, but I'll take this one on. Um, I'm, I have a really big concern about the respective interpretations of the freedom of navigation in economic zones. China spent 10 years in the law of the sea negotiations trying to establish historical rights as opposed to definition of land forms uh, in the seas <coughs> as a basis for claiming the nine dash line territorial waters. And they filed an exception to the understanding that the military would have freedom of navigation. The great maritime powers would never have signed the law of the sea if they were going to be restrained beyond 12 nautical miles. But China says you're restrained out to 200 nautical miles. Now, China right now doesn't say you can't operate there, but they're putting in the physical structure, <coughs> the air defense identification zone structures that we told them not to have. They're, that's what they're going to do with these filled-in islands and things that they're, they're, they're taking over, or they've taken over but are now developing in the South China Sea. And when the time comes, when the Liaoning and a couple other carriers are able to operate, they're going to declare a halt to freedom of navigation operations except by the leave of Beijing. And this could take us to a strategic conflict in areas where we have no real basis for conflict. And so I really worry about this uh, Chinese claim. And they are lobbying. They've got Malaysia on their side, <coughs> India, uh, I believe Brazil, Nigeria take similar positions on economic zones and the ability to deny other countries military activity, even transits in those zones. Anybody else want to take that up and we'll move on? Um, John McCarthy, did I see your hand? Yeah. Just uh, one comment first and just a couple of questions. First, the comment. I'd really like to congratulate Alan Gingell on his comments because so seldom these days do you hear anything out of Canberra which suggests we could have differences with the United States? Now, uh, I'm 100% in favour of the ANZUS alliance, no question about that. But essentially an alliance is much healthier if there is an expression of differences and debate about differences. And right now, there's very little of that in Australia. And I think in order to really understand what is happening in the region and where our alliance with the United States plays its part there, we really need much more of that. So thank you very much, Alan. The, uh, the two questions I have are these. Um, it seems that the greatest prospect of real problems uh, in uh, the Pacific lie between Japan and China rather than directly between the United States and China. That's where the most uh, barbed aspects of, 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 of problems have come to the fore. 
And I was just wondering what the view of our uh, American panellists is on the issue of how really to deal with Japan and China, particularly as the Japanese seem more likely to move towards a more uh, a tougher military posture towards China, uh, reinterpretation of the peace clause, Article 9 of the Constitution, if Abe can get that through his system. How does the United States intend to basically manage that relationship? Because that's where things are more likely to start. The final point is this, and again, <coughs> I'd like to hear from our American panelists on this. How is the United States now viewing the, I wouldn't say rapprochement, but the closer relationships between Russia and China, uh, given that you've basically got three areas of difficulty globally now. You've got, uh, you've got the Pacific, you've got the Middle East, and you now have Europe again. How do you see that relationship uh, playing out in your own strategic calculations? Thank you. I've yeah. been told that we're going to have to finish the, the session, so I might start with Alan. You might like, to, if you if you wish to take up the, John's original point, and then I perhaps give Peter an opportunity to make any remarks he might have, and then perhaps we'll finish with our American colleagues because we're going to have to finish the panel, unfortunately. So, um, Alan, do you have anything to? You don't want to rejoice in the glory of <laughs> John's <laughs> no, thank remarks. Thank you, John. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, Peter. Oh, you know, I, I well, I'm good. ahead. I think. <laughs> okay. I would agree with uh, John and uh, congratulate Alan on the comments. Uh, what are the points of differences? Um, I, I've said this before, but I think Australia needs to be in a position where we value and revel in the fact of this reliance, and it's really important to us. It's brought us security in the past, it'll bring us security in the future. But I just have a little niggle uh, in my Australian sovereign head that says, do we still have an ability to say no? Um, it's probably more extreme than a point of difference, but it might be because our interests may not coincide and, and the example of that relationship between Australia and Indonesia and the United States is, I think, a classic example. Um, that really put us in a, a bit of a corner at that time. So I'd like to think that as a sovereign nation, uh, we have the ability to say no. I'm sure we do but it's going to be at considerable cost, and particular cost would be to our self-reliance in the military capability sense. Thanks, Peter. Um, Carl, and then we might finish with Doug. Yeah, just uh, several points. On <coughs> Russia, China, I, uh, I think that's a, a very fragile relationship that uh, those two uh, nations uh, enjoy. Uh, if you talk to Russian uh, military leaders, uh, their, real gr their real strategic concern is in the longer term. It remains uh, China. Uh, China has historical claims. They have, they've secured the borders with Russia through agreement, but they have uh, historical claims in the uh, Russian Far East. The Russians have a, a demographic problem. I think we could be surprised in a post-Putin era how fast Russian uh, strategic orientation could change. Um, I think a lot of that orientation is uh, very much Putin, but that's speculation. On the, the question of the United States and Japan, our alliances uh, with uh, Philippines as well that uh, draw us then into uh, possible conflict with China over maritime uh, territorial claims. I recall when I was with the Office of Secretary of Defense as a, a much younger colonel, as one of these periodic dust-ups had occurred over uh, rocks and reefs, calling a, uh, one of my uh, mentors in the Department of State retired, and I asked him what his thoughts were, and he said, well, I remember one thing, great powers don't go to war over rocks, and uh, good advice. Having said that, uh, we do have uh, alliance commitments that uh, make this uh, very difficult for the United States to uh, manage, and the Chinese are not making this any uh, easier. Look, the Chinese, they're using salami slicing uh, tactics right now. Doug mentioned the uh, ADAs, the oil rig, uh, their behavior against the uh, Republic of the uh, Philippines. They are using assertive and bullying behavior right now. Well, Swinza, the very famous uh, Chinese strategist, had an expression where he said that uh, 
tactics in the absence of strategy is the noise before defeat. And so uh, I think if we look at Chinese behavior right now with regard to those maritime claims, they might be having a very successful set of tactics that they're using, but there's also those that have said only China can contain itself. And if they continue this behavior, I think they're going to find themselves getting contained through that assertive behavior. Finally, Doug. Um, <clears throat> there's a limit to the, at this point, if we don't drive them further together, there's a real limit to Russian-Chinese engagement. I'd like to look at the 2,800 kilometer river iron border. Do you know how many bridges cross that border? None. So the intimacy between Russia and China is, is, is not to be exaggerated. Having said that, I think the episodes recently in Ukraine, Iraq, and with Japan point up the, our loss of a sense of history. Kennan and others who thought deeply about these things said, don't build barriers between Russia and Europe. Draw Russia into Europe. And now we're throwing sanctions on Russia as a consequence of all. They're losing the big picture. In the Prince Gokroft, who I got to work for, was pretty smart when he advised George W. Bush, don't go into Iraq. Uh, you'd unlock a Pandora's box. And boy, have we got one now. And I think the same is true. History's <clears throat> lessons are being lost in Japan. The Prime Minister of Japan needs to be reminded very bluntly what the history of the war is and not to be going to the Yasukuni Shrine and celebrating an alternative history of what happened between the Allies and Japan in the, uh, in the 1930s and 40s. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, sadly, we've completely run out of time, and I apologise for that. This has obviously been a very rich panel. The contributions have been fantastic. I'm sure there are a lot more questions that we could have explored, uh, but unfortunately, we have to go. So may I just uh, thank our panellists for the great contribution they've made to the conference. I very much appreciate it. And would you join me with me in the usual way?